high energy prices, brownouts, blackouts, climate change, war in Europe, COVID, everyone working from home, a battery system seems like it's gone from a luxury to a no-brainer. Today we're going to check out what the perfect system would look like and see if this is maybe it. Two years ago, we moved into this house. It was built in 1910. It feels like I said no work done to it for the last 60 years. As part of the journey I'm on to modernize the property, I knew I wanted a home battery and solar system. With so many options out there, knowing where to begin can be daunting. Today, I'm going to dive into the thought process I went through to decide what the perfect home battery system would look like, how I chose this system, and see how close it comes to being the perfect system. So what does the perfect home battery system look like for me? And when you say the perfect battery system, some people will be thinking about, you know, theoretical batteries, but let's stick to what's possible to buy today. So one system isn't going to be perfect for everybody. You're going to have your own priorities and requirements. I started by making a wish list of everything I wanted the system to be capable of. We have 100 amp grid connection, so grid tied is what I'm doing. If you're going off grid, you're going to have different requirements. I want off-peak battery charging. So with the Octopus Go tariff that I have here in the UK, we get four hours of super cheap, I think it's seven and a half pence at the moment, off-peak charging of the battery system. So in winter, when there's not enough solar, we've got that four hour window where we can charge up the batteries overnight. I wanted a full grid down backup. So if the grid fails, I can continue to run everything in my house as if the grid was still up. I don't want to have to worry about it. I don't want to have to think about it too much. If the grid fails, everything should just keep going. Maximum utilization of self-generated electricity. We don't have solar installed yet, but it's planned for this year. When it's installed, we should be using as much of it as possible on site. With the current state of export tariffs in the UK, there's almost no incentive to export. We want to be able to supply a minimum of eight kilowatts from the system. We have an air source heat pump installed last year for heating and hot water. It's our biggest consumer of electricity by a large factor. And I want to be able to run it on this system without having to worry about it, plus everything else in the house. To achieve that, I want a system that can supply between eight and 12 kilowatts. I want a system that's modular and extendable I don't want to have to shell out up front for the full system and the full capability. So this way you can buy it piecemeal, add to it as required. My requirements could change over time. I don't want to have to throw out the whole system and start from scratch. So a modular extendable system makes a lot of sense. Maybe an amazing new battery technology will come along and that would allow me just to remove the batteries I've got and add them to the existing inverters, for example. I want a system that's open for integration. I want to be able to integrate it with Home Assistant and effort to have good community support. If I do end up with excess electricity, I want the ability to be able to feed it in. The price and availability is important. I don't want it to cost too much and I have to be able to actually buy it. There's some great products out there, like a Tesla Powerwall comes to mind, but you have to wait over a year to get one installed in the UK. So the system has to be reasonably priced and available now. I want it to be as efficient as possible. I don't want to be doing lots of DC to AC conversion and back to DC and then back to AC again. You want to make sure that everything is as efficient as it can be. So that means using MPPTs so that your solar power is directly charging your batteries without being converted to AC and then back into DC to charge your batteries and then back into AC for you to use it. It just doesn't make much sense. After looking at lots of possible solutions, I've opted to go with Victron MultiPlus 2 inverters and Pylon Tech batteries. But why? Victron inverters and other components have a really excellent reputation. They're considered to be some of the most reliable inverters you can buy. They've spent years being battle tested on boats and RVs. They're a bit expensive, but they're very reliable and compatible with lots of other components. The smaller MultiPlus 2s and the Quattro inverters from Victron also have a neat trick where they can be configured to run in parallel in groups of up to six. That essentially creates one large virtual inverter. 
satisfying my requirement for the system to be expendable, extendable even. I've initially gone for two multi plus two 48 5070-50s. The model number is not as complicated as it first seems and is actually useful to understand as they come in many variations and the model number explains the important characteristics. In this case, the 48 is the DC voltage for the batteries, 5000 is the power rating in volt amps, 70 is the DC charging current that you can charge the batteries with, and 50 is the pass-through current. There are also two similar high-level variants, the MultiPlus and the Quattro. These are mostly the same, except the Quattro has two AC inputs instead of one on the MultiPlus. That would allow you to attach a grid AC supply and a generator, for example, and have it automatically fall over to the generator when required. The Quattro's also come in larger sizes than the MultiPlus, but are also a fair bit more expensive. I have no plans for a generator, so I've gone with the MultiPlus. Both the MultiPlus and the Quattro have two AC outputs. They're identical, except the second one has a relay that cuts off when there's no grid supply. So you could wire up non-essential loads on the second output and keep essential loads running off your battery when the grid fails. The switch over to battery should happen within about 20 milliseconds, so it's almost imperceivable to things like computers. You may see the lights flicker. Obviously, if the grid failed, we'd be limited to the eight kilowatts the inverters could supply. I'm happy I could manage that by automatically shutting down larger loads like the heat pump when other things like an induction hob are on. We would only use the heat pump when there was power available. For batteries, I've got eight Pylon Tech US 3000C battery modules. Pylon Tech batteries are well tested with Victron inverters. They come in various sizes and have a good history of backward compatibility. You can easily mix older models with newer ones. As long as the newer battery is the master, this gives a degree of confidence that the battery stack will be extendable in the future. Each US 3000C has a capacity of 3.5 kilowatt hours and a rated max depth of charge of 95%. With eight modules, that gives me a theoretical capacity of 26.6 kilowatt hours. The Victron page on Pylon Tech batteries recommends the minimum number of battery modules that you should use with each inverter. For the 48 5000s that I've got, it recommends four battery modules per inverter. Coincidentally, at the rated 70 amp charge current that each inverter can provide, four US 3000Cs is also the number of batteries that can be fully charged in the four hour window of off-peak charging that's available in Octopus Go in the UK. Each inverter with four batteries seemed like a good number. At the heart of the Victron system is a small box called a Serbo GX, which connects everything together and monitors the system. You can get a MultiPlus that's got a GX device built in, and you get a separate one called a Color GX. The one I've got is the Serbo GX. The GX connects the inverters, the batteries, the grid meter together, and allows the state of the system to be monitored on your local network or online by the Victron VRM platform. Most importantly, for my requirements, it contains an MQTT broker, which makes pretty much all the data in the system available to external systems on your network and allows certain parameters to be modified. I use this to monitor this system in Home Assistant and automatically make changes to the configuration when required. So does this setup meet the requirements I'd set out for my home battery setup? Not yet. When I spec'd out the system, I expected I'd need three inverters and 12 battery modules. And I still think that's probably the case. It will give me 12 kilowatts of sustained power delivery and almost 40 kilowatt hours of usable storage. At present, eight battery modules is enough on warmer days. But if it's less than zero degrees and our heat pump is working really hard, we run out of stored power in the evening. Getting a larger battery capacity will also provide a buffer to allow for some more backup if the grid was to fail. I was reluctant to shell out for the full setup up front, so I wanted to be sure that it would all work as expected first. At the moment, only my garage is connected to the AC output of the inverters. I have a 10 mm armored cable running over from the house, and that's enough to run the inverters at eight kilowatts, charge the batteries at night, and with the aid of a grid meter installed in the house, 
the inverters can feed back power through that 10 millimeter cable to power the loads in the house. The grid meter is needed so that the inverters know how much power the house is drawing and it should feed back on the input. This is a temporary setup and it means if the grid fails, I'll have no backup power in the house, only the garage would stay on, which is better than nothing, I guess. So next up on my plans is to run a main grid feed over to the garage in a 25 millimeter SWA and back to the house in a second 25 millimeter SWA. That should allow the whole house to be backed up with the inverters and for there to be seamless failover when the grid fails. High up on my list of priorities is also getting some solar installed. With the Victron inverters, this is done usually using MPPTs. These sit on the DC side and very efficiently convert the high DC voltage that comes from the solar panels into the 48 volts that's required to charge the batteries or feed the inverters. So is this the best home battery solution? For the requirements I had, I think it's probably the best all round solution. There are lots of other options out there that tick some of the boxes, not all, but I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on what other options could I have gone for that would meet the requirements that I set out. Something like a Powerball meets some of the requirements, but then there are closed black boxes and they're also like gold dust, almost impossible to get in the UK. You have to wait over a year to get one. I think SunSync hybrid inverters could probably do most of what I need. If I was doing this again, I'd be giving them some serious consideration. There are also several other options for the battery modules that I could have gone for. Some might be better, but being less popular means less information is available and less community support is available. I'm starting from a blank slate here. If I had an existing grid tied solar system, for example, you might want a different solution to someone who's starting from scratch. There's another important factor. Some of my requirements have resulted in what is a fairly complicated and moderately expensive solution. I've mostly installed everything myself with the aid of an electrician for all the bits that require sign off. If you're getting a third party to install this, you'd need someone who already knows about Victron kit. It's quite complicated and most electricians aren't going to want to touch it. So far, I'm really happy with how this system is performing. With the work I've got planned, I expect this will end up being the best solution that comes closest to meeting my requirements. So I'm going to say it's the best home battery system for me, for now. I thought I'd quickly run over some of the things that I've learned since purchasing and installing all this that I wish I'd known at the start, or at least things that surprised me after it was installed. Having never had such a large battery system before, I was surprised by the behavior of the battery packs when in a low state of charge. Under about 15%, if the inverters start to draw more than about two to three kilowatts, the battery cell voltage starts to drop low enough to trigger the batteries to switch into sustain mode, where the inverters stop drawing current and start trickle charging. I suspect this is a combination of the batteries and the settings configured in the inverters. I could probably change those, tweak them to coax more power out of the battery, but I've not bothered trying as it's better for the life of the batteries not to discharge them all the way to the 95%. What I have tried and seems to work is to reduce the max inverter power when the battery pack gets to a certain discharge point. For example, reduce the maximum power to two kilowatts at 15%. That allows the batteries to discharge down to about 10%. The ramp up and ramp down time is also something that I hadn't appreciated. The inverters take a certain amount of time to ramp up to meet larger power draws. And when that demand goes, they take a few seconds to ramp back down again. To a limited extent, that's true of all inverters. But with this current setup, the grid meter seems to be very slow to inform the inverters of a change in demand which exacerbates the ramping up and ramping down significantly. The result is when a large load comes on, some power is drawn from the grid when it could be coming from the batteries until the inverter catches up. When the load then switches off, you end up exporting for several seconds until the inverters ramp down. 
I expect this will improve a lot or go away completely when the whole house is moved to running off the AC output of the inverters because you don't have that extra grid meter communication which slows things down. I had considered installing the batteries and inverters in my house to simplify the connection back to the main distribution board. I've ultimately decided to put them out in the garage. After installing, I'm really glad I went that way. The hum and fan noise from the inverters can get very loud under higher loads. I'd definitely be getting a lot more grief from my wife if they were in the house. When choosing racks for the batteries, I wanted to get as much as possible into the available space. I'd seen online lots of installations where people had left a gap in between each battery module. I couldn't find anything specific in the manuals about leaving a gap, so I opted for none. But since needing to contact Pylontech to debug an issue with one of my battery packs, in their response they mentioned, based on the photos that they'd seen, that ideally the pack should have a two centimeter gap to help with cooling. Currently it's minus six at night and my concern is keeping the batteries warm. So I'll probably keep an eye on the temperatures and see if I can find a way of mounting them with a bit more separation if they start to get too hot over the summer. But that's something to consider if you're planning to mount these in a rack. If you like this, please let me know by hitting the like button and please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss updates on my battery system or any of the other projects I've got coming up. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.